all of you who are interested in Dhamma, may I express my delight and joy that you have come here to this place in this way, namely in order to seek knowledge of the Dhamma which quenches dukkha, which quenches suffering. That we have chosen to speak at this time of day has certain reasons behind it. It's a time that is appropriate, fitting. It's a time when the mind is ready to open, to blossom, just like many flowers will, will open up at this time of the day. This is a time when the mind, our minds, are not yet full, are not yet overflowing. The Buddha's awakening came at this time of the day, and it's possible to think that the same was the case for the other great prophets. The thing we'd like to develop some understanding with you about is the matter of Dhamma. This is something that we need to understand more deeply and more clearly than, than, previous, than we have previously understood. The more you understand that which we call Dhamma, the more you will understand Buddhism. You won't be able to stand, understand Buddhism any more than you are able to understand Dhamma. So we should look into it more deeply, more extensively than you have in the past in order to understand it more than you understand now. When we talk about Buddhism, this is almost certainly something that you don't understand at all. You're probably, when you hear the word Buddhism, you probably start to think in terms of all the other isms, such as materialism, socialism, and include Buddhism in with these other isms. The problem with that is that none of these isms are naturally true. They're not the truths of nature. Rather, they are truths which human beings have made up and established from, for themselves out of their own thinking and opinions. Buddhism is totally different. Buddhism is about the truth as it is in nature, as it exists naturally, regardless of whether human beings take an interest in it or not. So when we talk about Buddhism, you should understand it to be the, the Dhamma, the way things are according to nature, as is understood or as is spoken of by Buddhas. So it's the Dhamma of Buddhas, of those who are awake. If you still, if you still like to use the word Buddhism, 
then please be careful to translate this suffix ism correctly. If you use the word Buddhism, the ism should mean the truth or law of nature, which Buddhists follow in order to quench, to end all dukkha, all spiritual suffering. In general, the word Dhamma or Dharma means the the way things are in nature, or it refers to the law of nature, the natural law. But here, we give it a more specific meaning, because we're speaking in terms of human beings. In this case, then, we mean, by Dhamma, we mean the the system of practice, <coughs> which is correct according to the law of nature, which is correct regarding survival, both mentally, both physically, and mentally, and which is correct every stage and level of our evolution, which is correct both for oneself and others. Let me repeat this again. Here, Dhamma means the system of practice, which is in line with natural law and which is correct for, in terms of correct regarding both physical and mental survival for every step and level of evolution for both oneself and for others together. It's quite marvelous that this rather long definition can be encapsulated in just one word, the word duty. The word dharma, which is a very ancient Indian word, has always had the meaning of duty. This has been the most ancient meaning of the word dharma. And we could add, just to make it a bit clearer, duty for the sake of salvation. You can say for the sake of physical survival and spiritual salvation. So the everything we've said about Dhamma comes down to this duty. It's very likely that this word Dhamma is much older than the word Sasana or religion. It's almost certain that this is a much more ancient word. That humanity has struggled and searched for its survival. That humanity from its beginnings has been aware that there are certain things that must be done. If we don't do them, we die. So these necessary things were called Dhamma or duty, the duty for the sake of survival. Now this understanding is very instinctual or has comes from the instincts. And so the, the word Dhamma 
goes back to this ver very early level in human development. But through the pressure and pushing of the instincts, these things needed for survival has pushed humanity forward. There has been a process of evolution where duty, our duty, that which is needed to survive, to be saved, has evolved successively on into higher levels. The struggle in search for, for survival is something we're able to do instinctually. This is an instinctual kind of knowledge. And so the ancient roots and meaning of the word Dharma means this, this, this age-old struggle for survival. Later we became more and more conscious of this, this duty, this inherent duty in life. And as our understanding of it developed, we began to call it sasana or religion. But even though this understand, religious understanding has developed, it still is basically coming from the instinct for survival, this need to struggle and fight, search in order to, to survive. And then that understanding has developed further. Don't see, be surprised when you hear that this Pali word Dhamma can be used even regarding animals. Even in terms of ordinary animals, we can speak of their Dhamma, the Dhamma of cats the Dhamma of dogs, the Dhamma of whatever kind of animal. We could even say the Dhamma of mosquitoes <clears throat> because all animals have their duty which they must do in order to survive. They all have their way of surviving, of struggling in order to preserve life. And so this Dhamma or duty is something that all animals must have, not just human beings. It sounds even more strange when we say that even, ha even plants have Dhamma, have their Dhamma. But within all plants there is that which struggles and works, fights for survival. And so that aspect or part of the plant must be called its Dhamma. This is the meaning of the word Dhamma when we look at it deeply. But because most people study this word only superficially, they barely understand it at all. And so they're quite shocked or surprised when we speak of the Dhamma of plants. But the meaning of Dhamma is the, the struggle, the system of searching and struggling in order to survive. This is what Dhamma means. And so it applies to plants and animals. We shouldn't understand it superficially in a, a narrow religious way or traditional way. You can see by now that the word Dhamma applies on to many levels. There is the physical level of our bodies, the mental level of our minds, our ordinary thinking, emotions, memories, and experiences. And then there is the spiritual level, the spiritual aspect of the mind, 
that is concerned with mindfulness and wisdom, with understanding things as they truly are. In coming here, you're already seeking Dhamma on the highest level, the, the spiritual survival level of Dhamma. But even so, we must, if we're really to understand Dhamma, we must, we can't overlook the other levels of its meaning. It's important to see this word in all aspects so that you can get the most benefit from it, so that you can study it most profoundly. Don't be surprised when we speak of Dhamma having all these levels, especially when we say that Dhamma applies even on the lowest level. When we speak of plants, we must talk about the Dhamma or duty of plants, this duty that they must do. If plants don't do it, then they'll all die. And then on the level of animals, while animals have their dhamma, their duty, without this, the animals will die. There's, there's no other way. And then human beings, more complex, but nonetheless, human beings have their dhamma, and duty, that which must be done in order to survive. If human beings don't perform this dhamma or duty, then they'll, then they'll die. Now when we speak of human beings, we must look at this deeply, because if we talk about survival or the duty in order to survive. We shouldn't just look at it on the physical level. There's also a mental or spiritual level. Human beings are not just bodies. We, of course, need to survive physically. But we should also survive spiritually. To die physically is not a very profound matter. It's very ordinary and common. But to, sur but to die spiritually is very profound. Although our bodies may be alive, we may be spiritually dead. This means that there's no freshness, no real life in the mind. There's no peace. There's no genuine happiness. This is what we mean by spiritual death. For human beings, it's not enough to survive physically. Our dhamma, our duty, means very much to survive spiritually, to be fresh, alive, at peace, <coughs> and truly happy through, through wisdom, through awareness and understanding. In short, the search, struggle, and fight for survival is what we mean by Dhamma. This search and struggle on whatever level is Dhamma. All these different levels are equally necessary and all together they're called Dhamma or duty. The words search and struggle should be understood carefully. They have various levels or stages of meaning. At first, this search and struggle 
is to to study Dhamma in order to understand it correctly, to investigate it so that we understand Dhamma properly. The second stage is to practice correctly according to that understanding. Once we know what to do, we must do it and do it according to correctly according to the principles we have learned. And then the third stage is to receive the benefits, the fruits of that practice. For our search and struggle to be whole and complete, it must include all three of these stages. To study the Dhamma, to practice it correctly, and to receive its genuine benefits. You have all come here, this is a fact, that you have all come here in order to study Dhamma, practice Dhamma, and receive the benefits of Dhamma. However, it's impossible that you will be able to do so completely in ten days. Ten days are just not enough for you to understand everything you need to know and then to put it all into practice in order to get everything that you ought to get from this practice. Ten days will not be enough. Nonetheless, you can study the basics so that you have a good enough understanding to continue studying. And you can begin to practice what you're learning here. And so you'll begin to receive some of the benefits of this practice. But in ten days, you, you won't be finished. It's necessary to continue the study, the practice, and the receiving of the benefits of practice. You should commit yourself, set your mind firmly on studying as best as you can so that in these ten days you develop the as deep and comprehensive an understanding as you are able. And then really commit yourself to practicing according to that correct understanding which you are developing. This is something to be committed to not just for 10 days, but for long after we leave here, even for the rest of our lives. You may return again sometime according to the circumstances of your life, according to your opportunities and your needs. But the important thing is to, to commit ourselves to this wholeheartedly, to the best of our ability, to the fullest capacity of our wisdom, of our energy, of our ability to learn. We study exclusively for the sake of quenching dukkha. Our practice is just to quench dukkha. And the benefits we're looking for are simply the quenching of dukkha. All aspects of what we're doing here are centered on quenching dukkha, on ending, cooling down and eliminating the, the spiritual pain that all of us carry, of dropping the burden of dissatisfaction, of, of 
emptiness, of unfulfillment, of stress, of conflict in our lives. This quenching of dukkha, spiritual pain, heaviness, unsatisfactoriness, dissatisfaction. This is what we're, we're here to do. But in this world, for the most part, it seldom happens this way. Look at your own, your own past. All the things that you have studied, all the things that you have learned, how much of it has been for the sake of overcoming dukkha? How much of it has been for the purpose of letting go of problems, of dissatisfaction, of, of inner pain? For the most part, what we've learned and studied throughout our, our lives has increased our suffering, our dukkha. It's made more problems, complications, and conflict in our lives. And what about our practice? Have we really been practicing in order to quench dukkha? Or have we been practicing, have we been living our lives primarily to find pleasure, to get pleasures of the senses or intellectual pleasures or whatever? Have we ever really practiced merely in order to overcome our dukkha, our inner problems and conflicts? And then what has been the results of, of our lives, of our way of living and practicing? Have we actually been freed? Have we actually quenched dukkha? Or do we find that the problems continue? The stress, tension, conflict, and dissatisfaction in life goes on and on. Dhamma, the, practice, the study, the practice, and the benefits of Dhamma are all centered on quenching dukkha, on living a life that's totally free of dukkha. So we should, we should bring this emphasis to bear on what we're doing. Otherwise, we'll just go along with the ways of the world, along with our old habits, studying all kinds of things which really don't do us much good practicing all kinds of stuff merely for the sake of pleasure, fun, and enjoyment. And then getting out of life not the highest benefit, but more and more dukkha, more and more pain, despair, and dissatisfaction. Our education in the modern world is huge almost monstrous. There are so many things we learn. There's so much information. It's almost infinite. It's incredible all the things we cram into our minds about technology, about outer space, about places we've never been and will never have the opportunity to go, about computers, and all kinds of fancy gadgets. Our education is full of all these things. But in spite of this, in spite of all this wonderful and incredible education, all this knowledge that we human beings have, we still, still don't have any peace in this world. We've been struggling for how many thousands of years and the wars get worse and worse. The famines, the poverty is never solved. We have all this, all this knowledge, all these universities that we're so proud of, and yet there, we still 
can't find any peace in the world. This is because all of our learning, all of our educations, our education systems, all of them merely respond to our desires. It's all fueled and pushed by our desire for pleasures. The whole thing is just to get different, different things that we desire. And so it all becomes a matter of, de of desire, of hunger, and of defilement. Education is just a mad cycle of desire and defilement. And so the result of it is never peace. It's all kinds of other things, but it's never leading to peace. And the reason for this is because our learning, our education, is not, is not connected with Dhamma. What we're learning doesn't have anything to do with Dhamma. It only has to do with our desires. And so we don't get the peace and the happiness that we seek from life. Next we come to our, our actual practice, to our commitments. None of us are committed to quenching dukkha. All of us are committed merely to responding to all the new, strange, creative desires that are stirred up by this world. We have all these different desires. This, we live in a world that is inventing new things all the time, which in fact is merely inventing new desires. To want this, we have to have that. And our whole life is committed to just satisfying all these strange and new desires. We don't have any understanding of dukkha. We don't understand what the cause of dukkha is. Instead, we just chase after all these new things which, which our so-called development and progress keeps, keeps coming up with. All this creativity that we're so proud of just gives us more new and strange things to to pursue. And in the, so we never, we never quench dukkha. We don't understand what we're doing. Well, our life is merely committed to the pursuit of new and strange things. In our modern world, we have a great deal of international organizations. <clears throat> we have many organizations which have been created supposedly for the sake of peace. But they don't ever succeed in bringing about peace. None of these organizations have much to do with Dhamma. They're not connected with Dhamma, based in Dhamma. An understanding of Dhamma isn't included in their charters, or in their way of operating. For the most part, these international organizations just have to do with all this business of new things to seek and desire. These international organizations are usually a place to argue and fight over how we're going to cut up the pie. They're places for competition and even oppression, the big countries taking advantage of the little ones, the little ones trying to, you, to group together in order to fight against other groups of little countries, occasionally even to stand up to the big ones. It's an arena for competition, not an arena for Dhamma. And so, None of these organizations think about what dukkha is, and they don't understand the cause of dukkha. 
And so the result of these organizations <coughs> is never peace. What we would suggest is that instead of the United Nations as it now exists, we create something better. We might call it the United Religions, an organization dedicated specifically to peace and that goes about this in a way that is connected with Dhamma, to work for peace not through competition and material struggle, but to work through peace through Dhamma, understanding what Dukkha is and what causes it. To do so would give us some hope. But if we just continue in the way we've been going, then all of our problems will continue. We'll never really solve any of them. Now, if we're going to study Dhamma, we must study nature. Because nature is Dhamma. Dhamma is nature, as we said earlier. Therefore, to, to understand Dhamma fully, completely, we must understand nature fully. This means understanding nature or Dhamma in all of its aspects. There are four primary aspects of nature. All of them should be understood. The first is nature itself, this whole universe that we, that encompass, that makes up what we call nature. Then there is the law of all this nature, the natural law. Then there is the duty. According to natural law, there is the duty that must be done. And then there are the fruits of doing that duty. When the duty is done correctly according to natural law, then a certain fruit appears. These are the four meanings or aspects of nature which must be understood and investigated thoroughly if we are going to understand Dhamma completely. So there's the universe or the cosmos. All the things in this universe without any exception makes up what we call the body of nature, nature in its entirety. And then within this nature, within all aspects of nature, there is a law, there's a fundamental natural law. And then with this law, all living things have a duty. In, for living things, there is always a duty to be done. When the duty is, is done correctly, there is survival and salvation. When the duty is not done properly, then, then there is death. Once this duty is done, there arises the fourth thing, which is the, the fruits or the, the proper result of that duty. When the duty has been done correctly, then re the result is we get what we've been searching for all along. If we don't do the duty correctly, <coughs> then we don't get what we've been looking for. If the duty is done right, the fruit is ultimately satisfying. So these are the four meanings of Dhamma the body of nature itself, the law inherent within all nature, the duty to, do, to be done in response to that law, and the fruit, the, the great satisfaction that comes from doing that duty correctly. We need to study all four meanings and aspects of this word Dhamma, if we are to understand things correctly.
let us stress once more these four meanings of Dhamma. Please don't forget them. There is nature itself, the natural law. There's the duty in line with that law. And there is the result or the salvation that comes with doing that duty. There's nature, the natural law, the duty according to natural law, and the, the fruit of salvation. These are the four meanings of Dhamma. Now there's a secret to studying all of these meanings of Dhamma. The secret is that you must study all of them within yourselves. These these bodies and minds of ours are Dhamma, our nature. All of these, all of what we call our lives are different aspects of nature. Within every particle or molecule of our bodies and with every, within every thought and mental thing, there is the natural law. Within all of all of the aspects of life, the natural law is inherent. And then all aspects of life, our arms, our legs, our livers, kidneys, everything has its duty. All the things have their duty that needs to be done in order to survive. And then there are the results of that duty. When when things do their duty properly, the result is satisfying. When the duty isn't done properly, the result is dukkha, is pain, stress, distress, disease. So all four meanings of Dhamma are to be found within these, these bodies of ours within this five or six feet of, of our lives. We can find nature, the natural law, the duty according to natural law, and the, the results of that duty. Now you can probably see that of these four meanings, the one that's most important to us is the third, because this is the one that we must do. The one that we have to practice is the third meaning, that is Dhamma. For our lives, there is always the duty that needs to be done. Physically, our bodies have their, their duties. Mentally, there are our duties. And then spiritually, in terms of mindfulness and, and wisdom, there is our necessary duties. To do all of these correctly is the most important aspect of Dhamma, the most important of all these four aspects. When we do this duty correctly, then there are no problems in life. Everything works smoothly and there is no dukkha. So of these four meanings, the one to to be most careful about, the one that we all must do, is the third meaning. Duty, duty is Dhamma. Dhamma is duty. So of these truths about Dhamma, the third one, the duty, is most crucial for us. All of this can be summarized in one sentence. Practice duty correctly according to the natural law so that no problems arise or remain. Please listen carefully. Practice, <laughs> practice duty correctly in line with the natural law so that there are no problems coming up or remaining. This one single sentence expresses the essence of Dhamma. 
to practice duty correctly according to the law of nature so that no problems arise or remain. This is just this one sentence is what Dhamma is all about. When, when this duty is not carried out properly, when we don't practice our duty as the law of nature specu- um, specifies, then the result will be problems. There will be problems arising and problems remaining in life when we don't do this duty properly. When, so we ought to do this duty correctly to, so that we can say, so we experience the life that doesn't bite its owner. This phrase may be a little strange to you, but you should get, be very interested in the life that doesn't bite its owner. When we don't, when the duty isn't done, when life doesn't do its duty, then it bites itself. Life bites its owner when the duty is not performed correctly in line with natural law. That means when we don't practice Dhamma, life will bite its owner. But when Dhamma is practiced correctly, life doesn't bite its owner. This kind of life is something to be most interested in. We can make an easy comparison. This dog is ours and this life is ours. But the dog hardly ever bites us. The dog never bites us. But life, our own lives, are biting us all the time. Sometimes love bites us. Sometimes hate bites us. Sometimes anger bites us. Sometimes fear bites us. Sometimes worry bites us. Over and over again we're getting bit by life because there isn't any Dhamma. When there isn't Dhamma, life doesn't do its duty. And so our own lives bite us. These lives of ours are worse than the dogs. The dogs never, they never bite us because there isn't, these lives are even worse because there isn't Dhamma. We'll mention these one by one for the sake of our investigation. <laughs> Sometimes love bites us, mm-hmm. and then anger bites us, then hatred bites us, and fear bites us, then excitement bites us, then worry about the future bites us, then longing after the past bites us, then jealousy and envy bites us, then possessiveness bites us, sexual jealousy or possessiveness bites us. There's a whole lot more. This is just a beginning of the things that bite us. But even just this, these few are more than we can endure. These of the things that bite life, of life that bites its owner. There's, in the ancient tales of India and Egypt, we, it's, talked about how if we understand life, if we know what life is about, then life is no problem. But when we fail to understand life, when we don't know the purpose of life, then life itself turns into a monster, and this monster haunts us. In India, there's common to tell the children that outside the village there's a pond and in the pond is a monster and whenever we pass the pond the monster will come out and ask us a question. If we answer the question the monster will let us go but if we can't answer the question then the monster eats us 
And the question that it always asks is, why were you born? Why were you born? For what were you born? If we can answer this, we live. If we can't answer it, the monster eats us. In Egypt, there's the story of the Sphinx on the road leading out from the city. The Sphinx was sitting at a crossroads. And then every traveler that came by would be asked by the Sphinx, where are you coming from? Where are you going? And how will you get there? Which is pretty much the same as the, the question of why were you born? What's the purpose of your life? Why were you born? If the traveler can answer the question, then the Sphinx kills itself. But when the traveler can't answer the question, why were you born? The Sphinx will eat the traveler. If we can answer this question, then everything goes fine. But if we can answer it, then the, the Sphinx devours us. In one case, the Sphinx kills itself. In the other, in one case, life conquers the Sphinx. In the other, it's life, it's like committing suicide. The ancients, whether in India, Egypt, or elsewhere, thought a great deal about the problems of life. And they expressed this in these tales and myths. For them, the question of why we were born was very important. Something that's worth observing is that the Sphinx has a face and head like a human being. And then one must wonder, how did the human being become a monster? The body of the Sphinx is that of a lion, something very powerful, fierce, and dangerous. And then the Sphinx has wings, which means we can never escape from it. The Sphinx can fly wherever we might run. So how is it that the human being became a monster so powerful and dangerous and able to, to follow us everywhere? This, this question that the Sphinx asks us, this, this fundamental problem of life, how did this become a monster? What's amusing is that if we know the Dhamma, if we understand Dhamma, then the monster dies. If we don't understand Dhamma, we're the ones who die. What this means is that if we understand Dhamma, there's no problem. The problem disappears. But when we don't understand Dhamma, then the problem appears and there are problems all around us. Next, we should look at the highest Dhamma. We should take the time to do so because it will be well worth the effort. We can study nature, the law of nature, and our duty according to the law of nature all together by examining the highest Dhamma. In this respect, then, the first thing to look at is the fact of anicca, the state of impermanence. This means that all things depend on causes and conditions. All things are related to various conditions. And so all things are constantly changing. All the things in this universe are a flow of change. The causes and conditions are changing, regrouping, breaking up. And so things themselves are constantly changing. It's this flow of ceaseless change. Whether we speak of things outside of ourselves or within ourselves, it's all just one great flow 
one great stream of change. This was known in Greece, and so some philosophers emphasized this fact. And in India, it was a central tenet in all the religious groups, all the religious sects. The fact of impermanence, this constant flow of change, which, which is the basic reality of everything in the universe. It's inevitable that we must live with these constantly changing things. Our lives depend upon, are made up of, these impermanent things. This means that we must endure them. This quality of having to endure impermanent things, of these, these always changing things, is the, what we call the, the nature of dukkha, which is called dukkata. This world has the nature of dukkha. This quality of dukkha is inherent in all these impermanent things. We call this dukkata. We don't have the power, the authority or whatever to control all these changing things. We have to endure them. We can't change them or control them according to our desires. This inability of ours to own and control things is called anatta, anatta, the, or anatata, the nature of being not self, the reality of being not self. All these things are not selves, not I, not mine. When we truly see these three facts, when we experience them directly, then we realize that, oh, that's just the way things are. That's the ordinary, natural way of things, which is called tamatitata, tamatitata, the natural way of all these things. If we continue looking deeply into things, then we start to wonder, hey, why is it that things are like this? Why are things, why do things happen this way? And then we see, hmm, there's this, there's this law of nature controlling it all. There's a law of nature controlling all these things. This realization that there's a law of nature controlling it all is called tamma niyamata tamma niyamata the natural order or law of everything looking further one sees that this fundamental law is that everything depends upon causes and conditions that things are interrelated interdependent because of the conditionality of everything this basic law of conditionality that everything depends on other things, on conditions, is called e tapa jayata, e tapa jayata. This fact is very important. This is the essence of natural law. You must examine it very carefully because this is the starting point for the quenching of all dukkha. The more, the more we see things in this way, the more we realize these facts, these reality of things, then we start to see that none of it can be taken as me or mine, that it's impossible to regard or classify anything as being me or mine. You can't just, you can't take anything, you can't grab anything and hold to it as being me or mine, or in cruder terms, as being ego or as something to get egoistic about. This profound understanding is called sunyata, 
สุญญาตา voidness voidness doesn't mean that things are empty or vacant or nothing this reality of s u n y a t a or voidness means that all these things are naturally void of me and mind you can't find any me and mind any ego or egoism in them If we see more, more deeply, more subtly than that, we see that all of these things are void of positive and negative, or positiveness and negativeness. That in things as they really are, there's nothing that can be taken as being positive or negative. There's nothing to regard or classify as positive. Or negative, things as they are are neither positive nor negative. Seeing this, then there's nothing to get angry about. There's nothing to fall in love with. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to get confused about, because things are void of positive and negative. This is the the final benefit of realizing sunyata, that things are. Are void of positive and negative. Sunyata doesn't mean nothingness or nihilism. It doesn't mean that there is nothing, that nothing exists. Things exist, things are, but they are void of anything that can be taken and held onto as me. Or as mind, as ego, as self, as egoism, or the things belonging to self. Sunyata is this voidness of me and mine. It has nothing to do with nothingness. Seeing this, realizing this voidness, it's impossible for love, anger, hatred. Fear, worry, excitement, boredom, and all these other um, these other painful states of mind to arise. Life won't bite its owner anymore. Life won't be able to bite its owner ever again, due to seeing this highest result and benefit of sunyata. When this is thoroughly realized, when the when sunyata is realized deeply in all its aspects, then this can be summarized by the word tata da tata da, which we can translate as thusness or suchness. Things are merely thus. Things are just like this. They're not like that or like that. They're just thus. This suchness of things is called tata da, where the mind isn't getting caught in this or in that, where the mind isn't shaking or moving because of these things. When we say tata da or thusness, it may sound like we're joking. That we're just kidding or speaking irresponsibly, but this word has the most profound meaning. Its meaning is most important. If you think we're just joking or kidding, then you won't pay any attention to da ta da, and then you won't get any benefit from it. You won't really understand life unless you take da ta da seriously. And really understand what it means. When the penetration by insight has led to this deepest knowledge, then one comes to a stillness or unshakableness of mind, where the mind is unshakable in correctness. Or we can say, in the correctness, the rightness of peace, this mind that is perfectly still 
unmovable, unshakable, in correctness, is called atamayata, atamayata. It's the mind that can't be stirred up, it can't be moved, shaken, or concocted. So we call it unconcoctability or atamayata. This is the result of seeing things through this most profound knowledge. The result of that is this unshakable mind of atamayata. Realizing the tathata of all these things, then the mind the mind becomes unshakable, perfectly still in the correctness of peace. What this means then is the mind sees that there is nothing which is atta, is self. There's nothing that is self, soul, atman, spirit, or any of these, whatever you want to call it. There's nothing that can be taken as I, there's nothing which is I or mine. So when we see, when the I, when they're seeing, it's just the eye sees, or the ear hears, the nose smells. There's no I smell, I hear. There's no I to hear. It's just the ear hears, the nose smells, the tongue tastes. The body feels sensations. The mind thinks. The mind remembers. There's no atta, self, or I behind all of it. It's just the nervous system which experiences. It's the natural function or duty of the nervous system. And none of it involves some ego, self, or I. When Dhaka Da is realized fully, then all of life is seen as being void of self, of Atta. When there's, then when the mind is totally unshakable, totally free of self, there no selfishness arises. There's no more egoism. There's nothing egotistical or selfish about life, and then all the problems disappear. The cause of all our problems is ego and selfishness. Remove this I, this self, in our seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking, and then there's no basis for ego, for egoism, and then all our problems disappear. When there is no more belief in self, when the illusion of self disappears, then selfishness has no basis. The ideas of things belonging to self is dependent on the belief in self. When the mind is free of all this self-belief, these self-conceptions, this egoistic consciousness, then there's nothing that belongs to self, whether our husband or wife. Another, they no longer belong to me. The home, cars, wealth, possessions, food, family, clothing, none of these are mine anymore. They're seen as they really are. They're not seen as being mine. And so there's no problem with them. They can't cause problems because they're not clung to or regarded as being mine. But that doesn't mean that we can't take care of them. If you have a, a wife or a husband, just because he or she isn't yours doesn't mean you can't take care of him or her. You can be responsible for your home, for home, cars, clothing, food, children, wealth, whatever, without needing to attach to it as mine. 
In fact, we can be totally responsible only when there's no clinging to things as mine. As soon as you take it to be mine, you'll get selfish about it. When, you're, when it's my husband, my wife, one gets selfish and possessive about one's husband and wife. And then it's no longer possible to really care, be responsible, or even love. So when we see that there is not really any self, the mind can get free of all the selfishness, which is the basis of suffering. When we remove all these problems, then life no longer bites its owner. When there's no me and mine, life is enabled to bite its owner. If you're interested in art, if you value art, you should take notice that this is the highest art. This is the most artistic activity there is. To be able to use anything, to, to deal with everything in such a way that there's no dukkha, so that you, whether it's a matter of status, fame, beauty, wealth, influence, love, friendship, all these things, we can take, we can benefit from them, we can make use of them without turning any of them into problems, without letting any of them bite their owners. Last of all, let's look once again at the meaning of the word Dhamma. Literally, Dhamma comes from the word to maintain. Dhamma means that which can maintain itself, that which can sustain itself. Anything, whether living or non-living, organic or inorganic, is everything that can sustain itself in one way or another is called Dhamma. Second meaning is that not only can it maintain and protect its, maintain itself, it can maintain and protect the one who has Dhamma. The one who has Dhamma is sustained, maintained, protected by Dhamma. Dhamma protects the one who has Dhamma. The third meaning is that it is the highest thing. It's the highest, most sublime thing in the, in the universe. Beyond the universe, if there is such a thing, this is still the highest thing. It's that which everyone must believe in. Not believe in the ideas about it, believe in its reality. Because it's, the, it's that which, on which everything depends. This is the one thing that the Buddha worshipped. Of all the things, the Buddha only worshipped Dhamma, the highest thing. The last item, and the most strange of all, is the fact that Dhamma cannot be translated. You can't translate the word Dhamma. Please don't even try. If you go and try to translate it into other languages, you'll just get the meaning wrong. You'll cut it up into little pieces and confuse things. The word Dhamma cannot be translated. We heard that in England there was a meeting or a conference in order to translate the word Dhamma. And they came up with at least 38 different meanings. And there were still others coming. And so they gave up and realized that it was just impossible to translate this word Dhamma properly. We can look at it in different ways. We can talk about its different aspects. But in the end, we can never translate the word Dhamma. So all of this are the things about Dhamma which you need to know more than you knew before. Excuse us for saying so, but you really haven't known very much about Dhamma. 
you know far too little about Dhamma, so we've taken the opportunity today to discuss the things about Dhamma which you need to know more than you ever knew before. Thank you all for being very patient listeners and you listen very attentively. We hope that the time has been worth the effort. Thank you very much.